thank you very much, Ted, for that very generous uh, introduction. It's always a pleasure to have a conversation with Richard Haas, because I always learn something uh, whenever I have the opportunity to talk to Richard, and I suspect we all will uh, today as well. Um, Richard, when we look out around the world, it seems like it's a mess. Uh, almost everywhere we look, we see governments uh, that are being challenged, leaders who are being challenged, in some cases democracies uh, that are be ch being challenged. One could argue it's true here, it's certainly true uh, in Europe, uh, in the UK, in Germany, in France, uh, Southern Europe's always an issue. Uh, it's true in South America as well, Venezuela, Bolivia. Um, we, could, we could go on. How did we get here? What's going on? I'll answer that, but I, w I just want to relish the moment here. It was 50 years ago this month that I got this thin letter in the mail rejecting me from, from Harvard University. <laughs> so, <laughs> you seem to have overcome this handicap, Richard. Uh, and for the record, I didn't go there either. <laughs> uh, look, uh, you're right to look out, uh, to see the world as turbulent as it is. My favorite word is disarray, but mess will do. A little bit less elegant, but it, but it, it will do. Any number of reasons. Uh, some are just structural. A lot of the machinery of the world is older than we are, which is pretty old. It was born after World War II, and it hasn't kept up in many ways. Lots of the challenges didn't even really exist then. Cyber wasn't a domain. Climate change wasn't on the agenda. So the world has those kinds of uh, problems. I think uh, there's more capacity and more hands than at any time we've ever seen in human history. Technology has really distributed capacity. Again, we haven't figured out what to do about it. Uh, Within countries, we're seeing things like not just inequality, but much less upward, upward mobility, which I actually think is a more important issue than, than inequality. We're seeing populism on the right, uh, particularly triggered by immigration flows from the Middle East, but also elsewhere. We're seeing populism on the left, again, for reasons more of economics. Uh, the, we're only a decade after the great financial crisis, and there hasn't been in many cases a, a, a full recovery. So you, people are uneasy, and at the risk of being pessimistic, which I guess I'm known for, uh, I don't think this is a passing moment, Larry. What makes me concerned is not just where we are, but if you think of history not as snapshots, but as a, a moving picture, there's no reason to think that this is going to pass, that it's just a moment. If anything, the population, populism we see is probably going to get stronger as millions of jobs disappear because of AI and robotics and autonomous vehicles and so forth. And even though new jobs will appear, the, the gap, the skills gap between the, the workforce and the skills requirements of these jobs is going to be large. It's actually a relevant challenge for everyone sitting in this, this room today. But unless we meet that challenge, I actually think the, the populism that we see will only get worse. So um, you paint, a, obviously, a very rosy and optimistic picture for all of us. Uh, let's stay with the populism uh, for a minute, because populism also seems to be giving rise to nationalism uh, in many countries. And at least uh, you study history far more than I do. But it's difficult to be able to identify a type in the world's history in which a rise in nationalism um, has been a good omen uh, for the rest of the world. Well, now you're competing with me on who can be more pessimistic. Uh, no, you're right. Uh, look, patriotism is a wonderful thing, pride in country. But what we see in modern nationalism, which has echoes of pre-modern or previous nationalism, is, is not welcome. And it, it usually has two dimensions that are really unattractive. One is within societies, uh, a prejudice against minorities. And we're seeing that around the... Uh, around the world developed and underde underdeveloped worlds alike. And then a sense of uh, excessive pride in one's country vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And so we're, we're seeing it. So you're right to see this, this kind of uh, nationalism. It's an interesting question as to why, because it's different than the populism. Part of me thinks it has something to do with globalization, that national identities are to some extent getting uh, challenged or, or threatened by this global culture. For certain countries, it's more of a reflection of the domestic politics. Russia, humiliated with the end of the Cold War, 
humili I think humiliated as well by NATO enlargement. Not much of an economy to speak of. For, for someone like Mr. Putin, who would never dream of making his country great again, because that would require real reform, but to have Russia seen as great again, to be respected as a great power, that means stoking the, the, the furnace of nationalism as, China, as China's economy slows. It would not surprise me if somebody like Xi Jinping turns to nationalism as a way of justifying the, the special role of the, this layer in Chinese governance called the, 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 the Communist Party. We're seeing a rise again of uh, illiberalism uh, around, uh, around Europe. So where this frustration, nationalism is one of the tried and true ventings or, or vehicles that we've seen in history. And for, all, and for some related reasons to populism and some different reasons, we're seeing, we're seeing a revival. Let me just brag for a second. The current issue of our magazine at the Council on Foreign Relations, Foreign Affairs, devotes itself to the rise of nationalism in this country and around the world. And again, it's relevant, I think, for this group. We don't do a very good job of teaching the American narrative. Jill Laporte has a wonderful piece in the, in the magazine. And if, we're not, if we don't teach what is it you might call historically accurate, approach to America's story, then rival stories, rival narratives will, will fill the space. And I think we're beginning to see a little bit of, this in the, of that in this society. You know, I want to, just for the audience, I want to try and frame some of these issues, the larger issues in the first part of our conversation, and then come back to what does it mean for all of us in higher education in, in the latter part. So not to worry, I want to come back and ask Richard how he thinks many of us should do our jobs differently as a result of some of these larger trends. Uh, but as we, as we think about the rise of nationalism, as we think about the rise of populism uh, throughout the, the world, um, talk a little bit about, or, or how is that influencing the capacity of our, our traditional organizations and institutions, which in many cases have served us very, very well um, over generations uh, in keeping peace, um, in helping to create a world uh, in which it's been generally easier for goods and services to move across uh, boundaries and borders, uh, for countries to work together, for scholars uh, to engage in scholarly exchange, for students to, to cross borders. You know, where do we stand in terms of the traditional institutions that have helped to sort of create the world that, that lives in today? And, and why does it seem that so many of those traditional institutions, organizations, relationships are fraying? Well, the answer is it seems that way because it is. So you're not misperceiving what's going on. Take a step back. This has been a remarkable 70 years. If you look at modern history, whatever you want to date it from, say the beginning of the, if some, the mid 17th century, after the Treaty of Westphalia, the modern international period, the last 70 years have been remarkable, and they've been a remarkable exception for the most part. You know, we call this the liberal world order for good reasons. It has been remarkably liberal. The growth of democracies has been quite remarkable. Uh, it's been global, and it's been orderly. The great power conflict, we, we survived a Cold War that stayed cold for the most part. And even though there were meaningful conflicts, obviously, from Korea to Vietnam, it didn't, it, it, compared to World War I and World War II, it was something of a different uh, scale. And then in the last 30 years, since the end of the Cold War, again, things have been messy and things have been fraying. But all things being equal as a period of history, this is without, uh, without equal. And when one looks at human advancement, the kind of stuff that Steven Pinker or Bill Gates and others put out, there are measures that show whether it's life expectancy, literacy, uh, the rest. It's, it's, it's been a remarkable stretch. The goal has got to be that this is not some exception that we look back on some golden era that's bracketed by the, the, the first half of the 20th century, which was arguably the worst century, the worst half century in modern history, and what could come next. It's the last thing we want this to be, to be known as a golden era that had a beginning and an end. Obviously, the goal of public policy has to be to extend it. The problem is that, I think a couple of problems. One is that the institutions that got us through this point for 70 years have essentially run out of steam. Uh, the, mech uh, the participation, no one in this room would design a UN Security Council that looks like the one we have. Uh, as I mentioned before, we don't have mechanisms that seriously deal with climate change. Uh, 
even if the Paris Agreement were fully lived up to, it wouldn't deal with the problem. And guess what? It's not going to be lived up to. Uh, we don't have mechanisms for dealing with cyber, even though cyber is as basic as it is. And then other institutions, alliances and the rest, I think one of the big challenges is in the United States now. We now, and I th while this administration has accelerated it many, of it, many of the aspects or features began previously, you have a, a generation of Americans who don't see the value in America's world role. A lot of intervention fatigue after Iraq and, and Afghanistan. And we don't teach these issues very well. Happy to talk about that more. So as a result, there's been a falling off of what makes the system work. It's almost a scientific idea. I'm not a scientist, but the argument is obviously that systems, the natural tendency in systems is, is entropy. And what we're seeing in the world is, if you will, the assertion of entropy uh, moving away from order. The centrifugal forces are gaining momentum because the world just doesn't organize itself. And you have those who are against the world as it is, the North Koreans, the Iranians, the Russians, to some extent the Chinese. And then the United States, which was the principal architect and, if you will, general contractor, we've decided we're not so willing to play that role anymore. And again, the system doesn't maintain itself. So what we're beginning to see now is a deterioration in the world because it has serious opponents and it doesn't have that many uh, players, including ourselves, buttressing it, anything like the way we've done. Joe, you mentioned China. Let's, let's look east for a little bit. Our mutual friend and colleague, Graham Allison, has written a very interesting and provocative book uh, in which he notes that uh, China is, is certainly the power rising in ascendancy. Um, threatening the United States, if you will, in terms of economic dominance and, and the scale and the size. And I think, um, you know, for most of us in this room, we're certainly aware of the growing strength of, uh, of Chinese universities and Chinese scholarship. Um, uh, the book uh, which frames the question as Thucydides' trap, Thucydides being sort of the first historian who wrote famously about the Peloponnesian War and about how it was triggered by the um, the rise of Athens threatening an existing power, Sparta, and it claims that sort of that war was in effect inevitable. And uh, Graham goes on to look at 16 case studies, you know, since then of rising powers threatening existing powers, and observes that in 12 of those cases it resulted in war. Um, how do you see the evolution of this relationship between China and the United States, and how do we ensure that it it not be uh, uh, it, it add to that, that category of unfortunate relationships ending in war. Yeah, I don't see eye to eye with uh, my former colleague on this one. I've worked for four presidents, and let me just make one point. There is nothing inevitable about history. History is essentially the collision of people and ideas, and what people choose to do and choose not to do and how they do it. That is the, that's what ultimately writes history. So the United States and China are not preordained to have any particular relationship. The, the menu of possibilities is great from Cold War, even worse, hot war. We could have conflict over Taiwan or, or something else uh, to something relatively, it, it, we're not going to be best friends, but I can imagine a relationship where we agree on some things and manage our disagreements uh, on others. What we have to do is essentially in ways not different than when we've dealt with other rising countries or challengers, is, is, is set up pushback to discourage certain behaviors and to reward others. It doesn't help when we want to take a robust relationship towards China, and then what do we do in the first week of this administration? The United States pulls out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was the best vehicle uh, geoeconomically and more broadly for dealing with China in, in Asia. It doesn't help when we raise questions about our alliances. Uh, China's slowing down economically, and as I said before, it's possible that it will turn to foreign policy as a way of satisfying nationalism at home. We ought to send the message, to some extent verbally, more by what it is we do, that that won't pay off. That's not a good direction. That won't, that won't help this or some future Chinese leadership. But I don't think the Chinese have a strategic uh, philosophy that inevitably makes them want to challenge us for global primacy. Yes, they would like to have a, a better or stronger position in the region, and we can and should push back. We've got the greatest multiplier effect of the United States in the world is our alliances. 
We have the structural advantage. China does not have allies. We have allies, whether it's Japan, South Korea, Australia, Thailand, and others. We ought to be strengthening our allied relations. We ought to be entering into multilateral, selective multilateral mechanisms that constrain China, force them to play the game by our rules, raise their game, particularly in the trade front. So I don't think anything's inevitable. It could happen, but that to me would be a major, if the United States and China in 10 or 20 years are in a Cold War, I would say this would, uh, even a Harvard professor would, should flunk both countries then on their statecraft. Uh, this is, uh, there's, nothing, there's no reason it should end up there, but of course there's the possibility it might. So uh, you mentioned that we have allies. Important that we treat our allies like allies. Um, not always happening, it seems like, uh, these days as we try and make friends around the world. No, we're much too preoccupied with the narrow cost of alliance relationships. We don't calculate the benefits nearly as well. But even on the cost side, think about it. The United States spends what now? $700 billion plus or minus a year on, on defense. Give or take, that's what? 3.5% plus or minus of, of our GDP. It's a lot of money, it sounds like. But it's still, we're spending on security roughly at a rate half of what we spent during the Cold War. We can afford these, uh, these commitments. We can have uh, both guns and butter. Plus, it's important to constantly remind people that what we spend on order in the world, coming back to your earlier question, Larry, is not a form of philanthropy. This is a form of self-interest because what goes on in the world dramatically affects the quality of life uh, here at home. So I would actually say that working at investing in alliance relationships is as important now as it, is, it has ever been. Plus, our allies are essentially our best pool of potential partners for dealing with these global challenges like climate, like cyber. Uh, if we can get them on board, if we can work with them, we're dealing with a North Korea or an Iran, we're far more likely to, to get an outcome that's closer, that's closer to our preference. So let's, let's talk about what all this means for higher education. Many of our institutions um, are uh, one of the great things about higher education in the United, in the United States, indeed in, in the world, is the diversity of institutions which are represented here today. But one of the things that so many of us have in common is that we are all dependent to, to some degree about being open and accessible to not just students, but faculty and academic talent, literally from throughout the world. I was just looking at the numbers uh, for Harvard. 38% of our faculty were born outside the United States. Um, 26% of our students university-wide come from outside the United States. Uh, for many of our institutions, we've been, for better or worse, the, the sink at the end of the rest of the world's brain drain. Uh, many of these students these days are coming from China. Um, what advice would you give to college and university presidents these days uh, about their relationships um, with China, with other countries and institutions around the world as we seek to figure out what our role is in this, in this changing world. So let me make one or two general points and then I'll get very specific on that. Look, I like the idea of foreign students coming here besides the obvious financial benefits. It's great because it's a potential source of real talent for this society. You know, every time I see the list of the Fortune 100 or 500, and you see how many of the founders were or immigrants or children of immigrants, it shows to me what a great boon immigration can be for this society. And I love the fact that non-Americans come here, get exposed to the liberal arts, get exposed to free debate, see a society in action, where, or see a civil society in action, and then hopefully go home. And some of those ideas and some of those uh, values go home with them. I think that is a sensational uh, thing for, for the world. So I think the bias has to be in favor of that. Now obviously we have a, now an, an administration has different views uh, about immigration. That may or may not stay the case in the future. What I think will stay the case, and this gets to the China part of your question, Larry, is that the United States will have a far more skeptical approach towards China. Uh, I've been involved in this business for a while. I have never seen a major consensus move as quickly and as dramatically as has the U.S. consensus on China. And whether we're talking about Democrats or Republicans, uh, there has, over the last two or three years, 
you have seen the real emergence of a much tougher line towards China. It's because of China's trade behavior, the sense that they've gained their, their entry into the WTO in ways that were never intended, because of the repression at home, uh, whether it's the use of the anti-corruption drive, new technologies, what they're doing vis-a-vis -vis the Uyghurs uh, and other, and their, their foreign policy, the militarization of the South China Sea, the more aggressive line towards Taiwan, what, what have you. And because of these three spheres of Chinese activity, people have really uh, changed, Democrats and Republicans, which is another way of saying, regardless of what happens in 2020, a tougher US policy towards China will, uh, will remain. That will affect everything from Chinese inward investment to American uh, investment in China. So that's, that's the context. I think there's also been a much tougher reaction to what China has done on campuses, whether this is the Confucius Institutes or whether this is individual Chinese uh, students. There's also both espionage related uh, issues, selective uh, hijacking of technologies to bring them home. There's also been a lack of reciprocity. So what I think, I think the future is one of two things, but either way it's gonna be more restrictive. But I would say either universities are going to have to come up with their own code of conduct or behavior to structure relations with Chinese students and the Chinese government, or it's going to be done for them by, by Congress or the executive branch. And I would think that we need a more restrictive uh, approach, but hopefully it's one that still allows a lot of interaction, but it's got to be interaction based on certain rules. And I think there's real questions about the desirability of Confucius Institutes, given what happens in terms of uh, content. I think there's got to be a total ban on Chinese using students for purposes of espionage, and there have to be sanctions when those, when those rules are broken. There have to be requirements for reciprocity. But I think we need to come up with a code of conduct for dealing uh, with China. And my, my, again, I'm not an expert on this, as you sense, but, but my, my recommendation would be that people in this room and beyond think of what a code would be before the Congress or someone else gives you a code you don't want. What, what advice would you give to anybody who has a Confucius Institute on their campus? Uh, well, it seems to me, this, I would say there's one of two things, either to shut it down and to think about alternative ways of doing Chinese uh, language, or if it is gonna be conducted, think very hard about what the terms would be. What is it? in terms of content, in terms of the activities of individuals, what are the red lines that if they're, they're crossed, uh, also if you want to set up a reciprocal institute in China. But I would be thinking about a plan B. I would, I basically, you know, there's been several that have been shut down already. I don't have the statistics at the tip of my fingers. But I would, I would think that particularly if US-Chinese relations sour, the pressure out of Washington to shut down Confucius Institutes will, will only grow. There have been other times, <clears throat> excuse me, in our history in which relationships between nations have been fraught. And one of the interesting things about universities and academics is that they can often do things that their governments cannot. You know, I think back about the role to, that the Pugwash played um, in the 50s, uh, the, which gathered scholars from around the world, um, uh, but prominently from the United States and then Soviet Union and, and elsewhere to focus on issues of of uh, nuclear um, disarmament and, and the like. What should our institutions be doing now um, to create these kinds of durable relationships among, among scholars that might actually help to build and create social capital that would be helpful in the future, um, especially if things get more tense between nations? Well, first off, I, I totally agree, whether it's Pugwash or other track two, track one and a half type relations, I think are good. I think also we've benefited enormously from the fact that generations of, I guess I call what, non-American elites have sent their kids over to the United States, then they've returned and ultimately entered into positions of responsibility. I love it. When, uh, when I was in government, I'd sit across the table and my foreign counterparts we would all have been educated at the institutions represented uh, in this uh, room. Harvard, like your own university at the Kennedy School, where both of us have spent time. You know, the, the various programs, say, for, I mean, I used to have one for you know, leaders of uh, officials in various governments. Uh, even I remember a time there was lo lots of things with Chinese military leaders and so forth. I think the more of that, 
uh, we have the better. I know in the, when I worked in the Pentagon back when, one of the programs I thought that was pound for pound as good as, as, good as any is when foreign young officers in non-American militaries would come over here and spend a year at West Point or the Naval Academy or one of our staff schools, our National Defense University. So I, I, I love that kind of uh, interaction. I think universities ought to be a place where, where it can take place. I just think with certain countries like China, it might be more difficult in the sciences. It should not be as difficult in the, in the social sciences. And again, we're going to have to think about what the rules are going to be. So we're going to go to questions soon. We've got a couple microphones set up. We, they're also supposed to be coming in on my iPad, which unfortunately has gone blank. So I'm going to have to ask somebody um, for help here because if I'm not. Were, if you were the president of MIT, this would be uh, yeah, easier to go. <laughs> I was, as, as you know, I was the chancellor of MIT uh, in a prior life. So uh, if I could ask somebody who is responsible for the technology to come up and, uh, and, and to take a peek um, so that we can get your questions. Um, uh, but um, we also have a couple microphones here, so people should, should go to the microphones. Um, how should we be educating our students differently for this world that you just described? I mean, if, if, if I said to you, Richard, you can have a hand in the design of our curriculum, in the design of our student experiences, in the way in which we think about preparing students to enter this world, uh, a world of increasing inequality, nationalism, populism, all the things which we've been discussing, what should we be doing differently to prepare students for this world? Well, I think it's the right question. Uh, I would, I would if I were running a university, which I'm not, but if I were, I would try to make my goal that every young person who left with a degree had under his or her belt certain skills. And I think in particular, though, I would say we would want them to have a foundational degree of global literacy, an understanding about how, why this world matters and how it works that's going to be such a part of their life, given the importance of globalization as an American. I would also want to have young people have a fundamental appreciation of American civics. I don't think we do a very good job of transmitting our, our DNA. And at the risk of losing everyone in this room now, I don't think it's enough that it's offered on campuses. I would require uh, certain things of all of our students that essentially, whether it's domestic civics or international civics, I believe that that is uh, essential. So I know, you know that we, we've done better on things like computer skills and STEM-related things. And there's a, there's a big argument about how many things you can require because there's so, only so many course hours and uh, the like. But my sense is, is we're falling down on what I would call both domestic and international uh, civics. And that is, uh, to me, for, again, certain students will have gap years and semesters and time abroad, and those things are potentially uh, useful. But I would actually say more useful than that, more useful than foreign language training at the university level is a basic appreciation of what makes this country's politics and society and economy tick and what makes the world operate the way it does and, and how it matters. It's the only way I know that people can become informed citizens, hold their elected representatives to account, can be competitive in a, in a global world. And I just don't think we're doing enough to prepare them for that. So let's go to your questions now that the iPad is working. Um, and the first one actually picks up on, on a comment that you just made. Because you were, in talking about the role of civics and civic education, you were, I think, referring to a form of skills gap such as, it, says, such as it exists. So our first question asks whether or not elected officials at both the state and the federal level understand the true nature of the skills gap uh, in education for now and for the future. Uh, I spent two Saturdays ago speaking with Penny Pritzker, the former Secretary of Commerce at the National Governors Association. And I think the governors and the mayors are beginning to get it. And I think a lot of people in the corporate world are beginning to get, get it. What we haven't had is the Washington-based national con conversation. But I do think uh, more and more firms are beginning to, as they see that certain jobs are going to disappear, they're instituting training programs many of which are in conjunction with local universities, community colleges, a lot of which are online. Uh, again, mayors and governors uh, get it. So I think there are going to have to be public-private uh, partnerships. 
Washington is, I think, a bit behind, <coughs> excuse me, the, the conversation. But this is going to hit us. And this is, um, it's almost like demographics. Certain things you know are coming because they're like super tankers. They've got a certain pace and they don't turn easily. So you know, where, you know what the society's gonna look like demographically in 10 or 20 or 30 years. We've got a pretty good sense of uh, debt. Well, we have a pretty good sense of new technologies and their implications. So I would, again, uh, so I, this conversation is beginning to heat up. We're beginning to see some interesting ideas about training, about uh, education, about portability of safety net is a big part. We've got to reduce the credentialing requirements when you cross state lines. It is nuts that everyone from teachers to hairdressers, often if they cross the state line, they have to totally get relicensed. As a society, in many ways, we pride ourselves on our mobility, and in many ways now we're anti-mobility. So we as a society also have to gear up where a lot of things from healthcare to other things uh, are not tied to permanent jobs. The average graduate of your institutions is gonna have what? 20, 25 jobs during his or her lifetime. Some of them will be full-time, many of them won't. We need now a, a degree of portability and flexibility of safety nets from healthcare to retraining accounts, almost like IRAs and the rest. We have gotta gear this society. And my, my sense is two and four year colleges, institutions of higher learning are gonna be an integral part of that. So next question is, the kind of populism you hold up as potentially dangerous is a close cousin to American ex exceptionalism, which, if real, is one of the reasons people seek out American higher education. How can we balance these closely related concepts? I'm a great believer in American exceptionalism, but I th I th it's most powerful when others say it about us, not when we boast about ourselves. <laughs> I never liked it when we'd run around the world calling ourselves indispensable. Let others reach that judgment. Let's be exceptional by the example we set. You know, I'm a former diplomat, which I know is hard to believe given how undiplomatic I am. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but foreign policy goes way beyond what the State Department does, which is just as well these days given how it's been gutted. But uh, often the most important thing we do in the world is the example we set. It's the strength of our economy. It's how, my, how r r standards of living go up. It's the quality of our democracy. It's how we've dealt with race discrimination, gender discrimination, and, and all. That's the way you demonstrate American exceptionalism. So what role do universities play in promoting globalism versus nationalism? What have, it, what have we done well? Where have we failed? Where could we do better? institutionally. Well, again, I come back to something I talked about before. Uh, I don't think most people who graduate from universities have a real understanding of how the world works and why it matters. And on a lot of campuses, yes, there's a lot of interest in, in climate change. I don't know how much depth, though, the knowledge is. But if people really thought about some of the things we've talked about here, about nationalism, the importance of alliances, about global institutions, about how you regulate cyberspace, about how you deal with infectious and non-infectious disease. What are the lessons of the Cold War? I mean, I remember when I taught at the Kennedy School, you mentioned the Peloponnesian War. I had to stop my class one day when I was talking about the Cold War, actually using one of Graham's earlier books, The Essence of Decision, and I realized that no one in the classroom had been alive during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so what I think universities have to think about is again, what is it we want our graduates to have, to leave the campus with them? Because I, I don't assume anymore they get it from their families. They certainly don't get it from cable television. They certainly, we can't count on them to get it from the internet, which is a truly uh, unedited, uh, no quality control sort of uh, space. So I actually think it means more, not less responsibility for people who, who run institutions uh, such as yours. So I think the, 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 the conversation, it's part of the general curricular reform conversation, is, is again, what do we need to impart? Because we have this special opportunity to reach people over two or four years that for the rest of their lives, uh, there's not gonna be those kinds of connections. You've really made a, 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 an eloquent argument for a liberal education, and uh, especially at this time uh, in history. 
um, where, as you note, information has become ubiquitous, where it's, it's technology has disintermediated the editorial function, where we really need our students to be able to differentiate the signal from the noise, to parse an argument, to understand the historical record and how it bears upon, uh, upon the future. Um, I also, if I can editorialize here, uh, think that so much of the tensions that exist in the world have at the root cause the tension between fundamentalism and modernity. Uh, we see it in this country um, right now. Uh, be, I, I think we see it certainly in the Middle East. We see it in other parts of the world as well. And I think that if we're going to educate students for a world in which they're going to have to grapple with some of these issues, uh, a, a deep grounding actually in the humanities is not a bad place to start. Uh, I agree. I, look, I went to Oberlin and I'm a great believer in liberal arts education. And I think it's part of, again, it's part of our DNA. I think, though, there is then a conversation, Larry, which is, and it's, I think it's a healthy one for every academic community to have, which is, what does that need to consist of now? And, I act, and there's no right answer or single answer. And I actually think it's healthy in this country where different institutions would come to a, a different answer that's right for them. And that way, students and others would have a degree of, of choice. I'd, li I'd like there to be some common features, but I do think it's a healthy conversation to have, which is, again, what is, what is, because anyone leaving an institution now is truly going to live a 21st century life. What is a relevant, adequate, liberal education for a 21st century life? Realizing that later on, almost like in your car, you're going to have to top off your gas tank, there's no way anyone can leave a campus with, with a full tank that's going to get them through the next 50 years. But ideally, it will be at least a, a start and a foundation. And it's that foundation that I think is critical. If you had children of college age today and they told you that they wanted to study abroad uh, or have a global experience, where would you send them for that? Uh, Look, here's what I would, uh, now, and this is where I alienate everyone I haven't already alienated. Uh, so it will be complete by the, uh, look, I th yes. I'm all in favor, needless to say, given you know, my own experiences of, of living abroad. I think you really have to ask yourself, though, about the comparative advantage of taking time out from your two or four years in college to do it. There is one of the reasons I'm a great believer in gap semesters and years in, in summers, if you can. Now, I realize for some, financially, that's a strain. So then, if, to the extent resources can be made available, so it's not only wealthier kids who have those, those uh, opportunities. But I don't have any single place. You know, in the sense, I could say you know, China or India or, you know, so, or some other country, Japan and other countries are going to be the most critical. But there's no right, it really depends upon the quality of the program, how well integrated you can get in that society. But the real question I'd ask is, since there's so much we want to teach for those four years on campus, my bias would be to keep students on campus for those four years, and they've got the rest of their lives before, during, and after school, those four years to, to spend their time abroad. One of the challenges that we all face right now is how to think about extending the college experience. Um, technology has given us the opportunity to connect with our students and maintain connections. Uh, I always say that the four years worth of tuition looks a lot more modest if you amortize it over a lifetime of learning. And, and part of what we need to reconceive of is, is the college experience given that we have the opportunity to do that. Uh, no, uh, absolutely. And again, you can't cram it in uh, because there's no way that what you, as good as, it, as these institutions are, there's no way you can do it all. I mean, think about it. You, know, you and I, we're the same age. We graduated college nearly, what, 45, 46 years ago. Things that are relevant and necessary today weren't even on the agenda. Now, again, critical thinking never goes out of fashion. Right. The ability to write well, to work with groups. I mean, the basic skills. Uh, don't, go, don't go out of fashion. Those are timeless. Certain philosophers, certain types of literature, and the rest, uh, what I would call, again, basic civics, global literacy, the kind of things that 
we're so committed to where I work at the Council on Foreign Relations to developing those resources. But I would think that you know, that's what universities can do. And, and, and the assumption that the specifics, it's always easier to, to, to learn specifics down the road than it is to pick up foundation stones. So that seems to me the, the division of labor. Well, I think it's a, a good note on which perhaps to draw this to a close. I, I would just note that um, as one of the common themes throughout your remarks is as we think about educating our students for the world that they will inhabit looking forward, it's a world that notwithstanding uh, the rise of nationalism, which it will be increasingly a global world, an increasingly diverse world, a world in which it will be important for students to continue to understand culture and history and language um, and all of the things that I think are so basic uh, to what all of us do. Please, Can I just make a 30 Last second uh, unpaid political announcement or what have you? Inst uh, we, I agree in this so strongly that I, I'm lucky enough, I, I lead this elite institution, not quite as elite as his, but pretty elite. And, and I've been lucky enough to do it. Uh, and I basically decided 10 years ago that that's not enough anymore. We have got to, elite institutions also have to become popular in the old fashioned sense of the word institutions to really become a resource for this society. We are, what we've done is we've created an entire new part of our institution to create a curriculum for Americans and others around the world to teach them about the basics of this world they're going to enter. And it's for free and it's online and there's simulations and curriculum materials and the rest. And the whole idea is, uh, so we're trying to walk the walk and not just talk the talk about getting uh, young Americans and others ready for the 21st century. It's not a solution, I get it. But without that understanding of the world and some appreciation for different cultures and history, it seems to me the odds of things getting, uh, getting uh, less messy than they are now are not what they should be. Please join me in thanking Richard Haas.